Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. Today, we're talking about Manhunt, the television series about the hunt for Lincoln's killer, John Wilkes Booth. This limited series just finished its seven episode run on Apple Plus. And today I've got not just one, but two guests from the show. First, returning to Below the Line is costume designer Katie Irish. Katie, it's been too long. It's great to be back with you, Skid. Thanks for having me. Oh, very glad to have you here. Also returning to the podcast is Gary Goldman, who served as the first assistant director for episodes three and four. Gary, I'm glad you could come back for this. Glad to be back, too. Appreciate this podcast where you highlight uh, Below the Line craftsmen. And uh, thanks for having us. This has been fun, and I've been looking forward to it. Warning for listeners, today's conversation will contain spoilers for the show. Um, hopefully you're at least familiar enough with the history that we're talking about, uh, that that won't be an issue. But, uh, you know, let's start there. People think they know Lincoln and the Civil War. You guys give me a sense of what um, people don't know or what misconceptions they have that you guys had to actively address with this show. I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I did not either learn or did not remember all of the plots that actually were laid on April 14th. You learn about Lincoln getting shot, but you don't hear about Secretary Seward or that they were supposed to assassinate the vice president. Um, So kind of all of that. And then there are all of these players that go along into the story, like George Sanders, who I never learned about, like Thomas Eckert. Um, Just there were people that I just I kept having to look up and find out who they were and, and what part they played. And for me, as a massive fan of history uh, or big fan of that period in particular, it was my comment has been broader in that to really understand how short of a time it was for the African community, the slaves to get um, to realize that they were freed and then to realize that suddenly they're their savior, for lack of a better word, Lincoln was killed. So that roller coaster ride was really um, horrific and uh, amplified and and brought out in this um, amazing show. Well, we're going to take the opportunity of having the two of you here to dive deeper, specifically into episodes three and four, again, where you uh, you were the first AD, Gary. But before we do that, let me take a step back. Katie, how did you get involved with this project? Believe it or not, through Twitter. I followed Monica on Twitter for a while. I had been a fan of other projects that she had worked on, and I saw when the show was greenlit. And we're talking about Monica Boletsky, the creator of the show. That's correct. Yep. Creator, showrunner. Yep. And I posted something, you know, I commented and said something about like, this sounds like an amazing project. And then... A week and a half later, my agent called and said that I had an interview. And so from there, I just kind of threw myself into it and didn't stop until we we finished. And Gary, how about you? What brought you into the manhunt world? Um, I had worked with uh, the line producer, Mark David Alpert, before and am very close with uh, the director, John Dahl. And both of them reached out to me to say, get down here. To Savannah. Um, and I came a run. And when you get to work with professionals like uh, Katie and John Dahl and Mark Alpert, uh, your life is going to be mostly focused on the quality of the product and no drama, which is boring. And so John Dahl was the director on three and four. And as I understand it, Katie, you actually knew John from previous work as well. That's right. I had worked with John on the Americans. And so it was wonderful to see him again and get to collaborate. Now, with a show like this, and as we dive into uh, episodes three and four a little deeper, you've got one director for both. Does that mean, Gary, anything from either episode you're filming, or are you doing three and then doing four? Is there something more timely about it? Uh, the, the vernacular for that is we cross-boarded. They cross-boarded episode one and two. So all the scenes in one location during one and two were shot during that period. And same with us in three and four. We cross-boarded episodes three and four which is uh, not easy to do and sometimes makes it easier, but uh, it's a, it's a gigantic uh, puzzle and um, to put together and uh, we were able to do it. 
I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I yeah, I think it came out pretty well. So there's a series of scenes in episode three that I specifically want to uh, hear you guys talk about. And that's when Company G, which is a military unit of black soldiers, is handing out rations in this town. Talk to me both about the unit, the town. Like, what memories does that bring up for you guys? Well, I'll begin and maybe Katie can jump into it. Is that first of all, we're shooting in Savannah and we're shooting in uh, a place that something like this could actually have happened. And just for the production design of it, um, uh, they took about two blocks on every side and covered the streets with mud and uh, took away anything that looked electrical and filled it with um, horses and people and um, period uh, carriages horse carriages. So you really, when you walked onto that set, you definitely stepped back in time. And what sealed the deal for me was seeing uh, the wardrobe that Katie put everybody in from the extras to her uh, principals. Thank you. Yeah, no, we, um, we were shooting right outside the location that we were using for Stanton's home in one of the beautiful squares that is in Savannah. And as Gary said, there, I mean, production just had dumped mud everywhere, um, which is, you know, what the streets were largely at that point. And so dealing with that, and then we had the fantastic Company G soldiers, and then a lot of extras that day, as well as the horse wranglers and the stunt doubles and, and all of those people. And given the time period, all of the men, or almost all of the men, were in wool. Uh, we shot this on like July 7th in Savannah. It was a beautiful sunny day. And so it was hot. And we uh, just, you know, it was really wonderful to watch it all come together, though, because when you get behind a monitor and all of a sudden you see how. John and Trevor, uh, who was our DP for the, those two episodes, uh, were framing things, what they were seeing, and the story as it was coming together. Um, for me, it was really the humanity, seeing these men in the company who had made it through the war, and just kind of that relief, and that they were able to do this work. And then seeing just, you know, the line of people who needed rat food rations, for, which is uh, what is happening in the scene. And just, you know, all ages, you know, and, and it, it was really a wonderful kind of moment of humanity. Until it wasn't. <laughs> Until it wasn't. I will tell you that that day, uh, anyone that has illusions of uh, grandeur that what we do out there is just a lot of craft service and, and having <laughs> some fun. Um, it was hot as hell out there and you're dripping sweat. And like uh, Katie said, that every extra and principal out there was in wool and they were just, uh, for lack of a better word, troopers. And there you are working and you better get a water every uh, 45 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, lastly, uh, you want to go, Skid? Want to ask another question? Or you want me to keep going? No, keep going. I'll interrupt you guys. Keep going. I, I mean, while while your while your principal cast, uh, as they say, make the script sing and bring life into those main characters that we talked about earlier, uh, this specific scene truly brought life to uh, brought it to life because of the extras and um, the extras. All the black extras uh, were. We talked to them and said, "This is, could be a powerful scene for you to watch." And, um, you know, you're literally they were like, we are literally in the clothes of our ancestors. And uh, there wasn't one person there that wasn't fully engaged and wanted to be there and relive what, the, what their ancestors had gone through. And there was a number of them that had tears in their eyes uh, for it and appreciative of maybe where they are now and just getting their whole perspective. Obviously, I would not dare to speak for what that experience was. And I'm sorry if I come off of that I am, but just I was close enough to watching them and engaging with the extras that day that were such uh, important element and what they brought to that scene and from their heart and soul was uh, extremely meaningful to watch. It's the most meaningful scene I've ever, um, I personally ever worked on uh, watching them be 
truly engaged. And for me, one of the things that I have loved from the beginning of this series is seeing stories that are not told, stories of Black Americans at this time, whether they were yeah. enslaved, whether they were free people. It, you know, I, it's just so often you don't hear those stories, see those stories. And to work on this show where those stories are as important as any of the other storylines that we are following was really, really a wonderful thing for me. Well, we've alluded to it, but these um, series of scenes do take a tragic turn where one of these soldiers is murdered by a white townsperson who thinks he's stealing a horse. Um, and that leads to altercation and fighting. Now, again, for both of you and all this mud we've talked about before and horses, I mean, all this is another level of complication. Talk to me more about when this scene turns and, and what that meant for both of you. I mean, for me, the scene turns because you have the uh, Company G, you have Cuffy, who is one of the officers, and Alec LeConte, who is the soldier who gets shot. And they are handing out bread, and Alec slips a, another loaf of bread to a family that has some kids. And then behind them, a woman walks up and says, I want mine. And it kind of escalates from there. And so one of the things that you see then are the police rush in. And if you know anything about the police at this point in history, um, they're a gang, for lack of a better term. They, it's, you know, they're a gang with badges. And so they rush in very equal to throw their weight around and, you know, be the, the white men that are coming to the rescue and the confrontation between this black unit that is there on a federal level that outranks them. Um, for me, it was just like seeing so many things that flashed through in the 60s and during the civil rights. It's just, you can see the repercussions throughout our history from that moment forward. We've all, sh we've all shot scenes that have stunts in it and explosions and gunfire and uh, all that, but this was, uh, the magnitude was uh, increased of the, the tension, watching it fall out for all the reasons Katie said, but also in that scene, John uh, Dahl was able to establish as the script went, uh, sort of uh, a mellow day. I don't know that's a terrible term to use, but a normal day for just after the war with people trying to get food and watching the daily lives of the slaves, of the soldiers, of the police, of Company G, what their life was at that moment. And you get sucked, you get wa you wallow in just the moment, and then it turns on a dime. Uh, and that was, and because it was racial, because of the period, it was very intense to watch. And it wasn't just another uh, scene where you're like, oh my God, is the, is the actor okay? Is the horse okay? Um, back to one, let's go do it again. Each time you had to kind of, uh, the company and the cast and the extras had to gear up to watch uh, this murder take place again of a young black man uh, murdered for just to, for, so someone could steal his horse just by saying it was their horse. Um, it was intense to watch and uh, it was uh, really cool to be a part of. Now, Katie, the uniforms that you, the uniforms of Company G, there are differences, but certainly even with the extras in this scene, each one of them has been fit and has uniforms specifically for them. Like This isn't something you're going to pick up off the rack. <laughs> no, um, anybody that was on our show was pre-fit. It did not matter if they were super deep in the background or featured or a principal. Everyone came through before the day of to get fit because we wanted the look to be real and to be just right for them. And as you mentioned, yes, all of the company G members had come through. And so the uniforms could be fit correctly. So that way they would know, you know, this is where everything is. This is how you wear it. This, you know, get accompanied to it because 
the thing that I never want is someone uncomfortable in their costume or feeling nervous about what they're wearing because then they can't do their job on set. If they're worried about the clothes, then they are not worried about what's happening in the scene, reacting and being the actor that they have been hired to be. So by seeing everyone ahead of time, I get to get that out of the way and get them used to everything. And especially in a time period like this, where it's, you know, it's a little bit different. There weren't zippers. It also took a long time to do all the buttons <laughs> on everything and, you know, to just to, to get used to the weirdness of it, for lack of a better term. Yeah, the, the principal cast that uh, Katie dressed were just amazing as well. And I'm sure you'll get into that, but the dresses and um, what Tobias was wearing every day, uh, they once they went into those costumes, um, they were those characters. And I'm sure you'll talk later about, especially uh, Hamish Linkletter playing um, Lincoln was just unbelievable to you. You literally went back in time to be in those rooms and in those, not only in those rooms, but in those locations with those people and in those costumes. Um, but you still had to do all the, you know, the behind the scenes work that we were doing, getting, you know, I'm sure Katie and her team were there at 4 a.m., getting some cast members through the works. And by the time I show up uh, 20 minutes before a crew call, uh, that place was populated and jumping into some serious filmmaking. You know, let's take a moment to talk about uh, some of the actors and uh, specifically Hamish Linklater as Abraham Lincoln. Not a spoiler to say he dies in the first episode of the seven episode <laughs> series, but the way the story is told, he's in a lot of scenes throughout and everybody thinks Lincoln's hat, it's iconic. That must have been very simple to dress Lincoln. But again, because it's so iconic, you have to do a lot more work to actually make this real. That's exactly it. It's how do you take an icon and make him a real person? Um, you know, Hamish had his own heavy lifting to do, but I wanted to make it easier for when he got dressed in those clothes to feel like the character. So there were some things that we were able to figure out. Um, one of the things I loved is that Lincoln always wore riding boots underneath his pants. He And so those boots change how you walk. They change how you stand. Um, and then when he got home at night, he had a pair of slippers that had embroidered goats on them and he would change into the slippers. And so it was like he was taking off this kind of political, you know, this was the weight of the world, the heavy boots and going into something whimsical was really charming to me. Um, it was something that was familial and had a characteristic to it that was was just lovely. Um, and so finding those things helped humanize him for me. Um, but then, you know, you get buffeted right back to the fact that on the night he was assassinated, he was wearing the coat he had worn to his second inauguration. And inside it was all of this beautiful embroidery with eagles holding a banner that says one country, one destiny. And it's like, how do you, you know, how do you, you, you it's, it's, I couldn't come up with that on my own. That is something that is just, truth is, you know, better than any fiction I could create there. And so you just, you take those little gifts as they come. Well, I also want to talk more about some quieter scenes from both your perspective. Let's talk about uh, Booth on the run with his uh, traveling companion, David Harold. Uh, it was uh, Anthony Boyle is playing John Wilkes Booth and Will Harrison is playing David Harold. Gary, Katie, tell me about executing with those guys. The David Harold character, um, this is one of his first big role, bigger roles. And um, Anthony... Boyle, who played John Wilkes Booth, is really blowing up right now. You can see him right now in Masters of Air. I think it's called an Apple. And he's Irish as Irish can be. I mean, he's got a brogue that um, <laughs> is surreal. I mean, I'm like, it's real Irish. They're both great guys. And we spent a lot of times in the middle of nowhere with them, trekking through woods, over ponds, through lakes and uh, mud patches. 
uh, with their horses. Uh, the interesting thing, you know, was that when John Wilkes Booth jumped after the murder, jumped down and broke his leg. So he was traveling this massive journey uh, with a broken leg. So uh, that was um, and we weren't shooting all those scenes in order. So sometimes the bandages were more, sometimes the bandages were less. And we really had to track that. Um, but just working with them and, and seeing how Anthony um, seriously took both of them, took their roles in their relationship. And uh, it was it was great to watch. But the filmmaking of them literally on their horses the whole time and, you know, trying to trek through those woods with uh, cameras and, you know, doing, you know, 200, 300 feet of dolly track through the woods, uh, clearing that out with greens two days before spraying the entire area for mosquitoes checking every under every branch for snakes every single day with two oh, snake wranglers around um and plus the heat and plus the bugs that just would not quit um those guys were troopers and i think they really lived those characters uh amazingly well i mean they really brought it home but in those conditions and you know they didn't have a ton of costume changes but we made a ton of those costumes for exactly what Gary was saying. We didn't shoot in order. And so I needed to have multiples of their pants. Had they gone through the water yet? You know, are these pants wet on the bottom or are they dry? Have we gone through the swamp with the mud? Do we see? And so the continuity of tracking that, um, we actually made 20 of the costume that Anthony wears as Booth to allow for the various stunt doubles that he had, but also just the different levels of sweat and disgusting swamp and mud and dirt and grime just to build up. So that way, when, you know, we see him later, we, we see this journey on him. Another part of that journey that struck me is when they're joined by their guide, uh, Oswell Swan, played by Roger Piano, I think I pronounced his last name. Um, in a shorter production, I feel like maybe you just throw some clothes on him. But also his wardrobe seemed intentional to me in a way, Katie, that I was curious about what led up to that character. Yeah, I want to hear this. Too. What his costume says about him, his costume <laughs> choices. I mean, Oswell Swan is a fascinating character. Um, we know... And he says that, he, you know, he's a free man. He's always been free. His mom is a member of the Piscataway tribe and his father was a free black man. And so bringing together those two pieces of his history and also knowing that he he does this for a living. He is a guide for, you know, this part of the land. And he also is one of the very first characters we see challenge Booth. He's one of the first characters who really calls on David Harrell. I mean, he calls him a lackey. He's like, you're not his friend. You know, there are some really harsh moments of truth that are delivered by Oswell Swan. And so with him, he kind of lives according to his own rules. And so we didn't feel the need to have him in all of the pieces that society says a man needs to wear at this point. So he doesn't have the vest. He doesn't have the overcoat. It's hot. He doesn't need, he's like, I don't want this. I'm trekking through the woods. You know, when we meet him, he doesn't even have a shirt on. And so he really is a man living his life according to his rules and the rules that society lets him live with. And so we, I wanted that to be reflected in his, in his clothing. Who did Swan pass the boys off to uh, to get them the the rowboat? And he was dressed like a real mountain man. Who was the that? The river ghost. The river ghost. That character. Now a lot of these times, I'm prepping. Kate's Katie's prepping. I don't see a lot of these guys until they walk onto set. That was one of the characters my jaw dropped. I was like, oh, look at the river ghost. Obviously, with that <laughs> name in the script, you're expecting something impressive. But if you don't mind, tell me about how you came up with that and that character, because he's really amazing. 
Thank you. The River Ghost is like one of my secret favorites. Um, yeah, mine too. <laughs> he, he's, it, it was so fun because we know he lives off the land. We know that, you know, he, he doesn't have a name. And so he is meant to blend in to his surroundings. And so I came up with this entire backstory about how he had been a Confederate soldier that had deserted. And so he has these really broken down, worn Confederate pants from the uniform that he wears. And his shirt base is from the Confederate uniform. But then everything else about him has been from the, you know, flora and fauna of the surrounding areas. So we looked in the Maryland basin to find what kind of, what animals were populated at that point. I had a fantastic realization that you can make leather out of fish skin. And so he has these great like fish skin leather suspenders and uh, his cape is all deer hide that has been tanned different in, you know, different finishes, um, which I stitched together on the floor in Philadelphia as we were uh, up there shooting uh, in when we did our unit there, which was right before we started on episode three. Um, I hadn't intended to build it myself, but if you can't accurately describe to someone what you want, then you end up building it yourself. <laughs> and so- He literally put Grizzly Adams to shame. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's what he looks like. He's like in skins and a hat and just, just a really inhabited- his clothes and his clothes inhabited him. It was really, really cool to see him walk on set that day. Yeah, I just, and I love what John did about how you hear him, but you're not sure if it's a bird or an animal. And then he just emerges out of the darkness. It's, it was, it was perfect in my opinion. Well, I'm going to ask you guys about another set piece where the challenges are maybe exactly the opposite. And that's the gold traders room on Wall Street, where you have these very well-dressed, respectable gentlemen um, of different factions figuring out gold and money and helpful maybe to fill in some of the plot there as well. But then this is going to lead to uh, Lafayette Baker, played by Pat Oswalt, coming in with a group of men and arresting a bunch of them. That was one day. And we got a scene at the end of the day with Tobias uh, talking to a lawyer um, at the end of the day, that was one very, very long uh, day. We shot in this um, old museum, I think it was. Um, and they made it, uh, the production designer. Um, Chloe Arbiter. Oh, Chloe. Love Chloe Arbiter. She made this uh, old museum and created uh, old tr chalk trading boards, a stage where the, the guy wrote, you know, the sale of the gold up and down. And this is an incredible example of the juxtaposition of the period that we were in from wealth to poverty. Um, so we already talked about the poverty of, the, of not only the black people at the time, but the white people at the time as well, just getting out of war. And now you have these um, traders that literally go to trade in black tie and white shirts and hats and are looking pristine. Uh, even though they were against the South, um, they would trade uh, because they were taking advantage of the of being able to trade gold, and they were you weren't you weren't supposed to do it, so it was illegal to do trading with the South. But they were like, we're still doing it. We don't care. Um, so that's why Patton's um, uh, character comes in to arrest them. So uh, it becomes a little bit of a riot and a beat down from Patton's police to these incredibly well dressed uh, stock traders. There were a lot of white men in this scene. And my challenge was m helping the audience be able to know which group these people all belonged to. And so as, as Gary laid out, you know, you had the men who were actually doing the trading and they were exceedingly formal. They had their top hats and it was something that I double checked about three times that they would all still be wearing their hats. And the idea was you were just passing through. You were never going to be there long enough to, to take your hat off. There weren't any ladies present. And so we had that kind of silhouette of the top hat and you had the very lush and, you know, 
kind of almost I won't say foppish, but very colorful vests that all the men were wearing at the time. And then you see Pat Oswalt come in with his men who are much more, you know, the kind of working solidly, you know, cl middle class guys who were not wearing the top hats. So we had different shape hats on them. And then you had the people who actually worked in the trade room. And so they had chore coats on and, you know, so we were trying to delineate visually to help everyone follow what was happening. Um, but one thing that just still makes me laugh is as we were doing background fittings for all of the men that were going to be storming the trading room with Patton's character, Lafayette Baker, um, you know, we kept coming back to shoes on all of these guys because it was a head to toe look. And someone, and I don't know who it was, I'm not trying to, but I, someone told my background fitters, like, you don't need to worry so much about their shoes. This isn't a shoe shot. Like, you know, they're, they're rushing in. And what was the thing that introduces this scene, but all of their feet rushing <laughs> by? And so my assistant costume designer, uh, Jen Caprio, who was in charge of background was like, see, it is about shoes. <laughs> so it just goes to show, you never know what the shot is going to be. And so we always prepare from top to bottom as best as we can. Sorry, I was looking for a photo of that day. I, I, I can't find it that quickly, but that was pretty cool. Here's a photo, can I show a photo? <laughs> this is a photo of um, oh, yeah. Tobias and his wife uh, at their home. And he just came back from uh, breaking up the fight that killed the uh, young black soldier. And he's suffering from asthma and just the trauma of what he saw. It's, it's quite a moment. Yeah, Tobias Menzies was playing Edwin Stanton and is really our protagonist for the entire series. Yeah. yeah. How was he to work with? I mean, for me, he was a drink. I can't say enough. I mean, a consummate professional, literally inhabited. Each one of these cast members, I think, completely changed more than other cast members I've seen when they slipped into this costumes. Um, more because most of the cop people that we work with are we're shooting modern day and they're in their phones and they're like, you can kind of get who they are in a general if you give a little bit of uh, forgiveness and you just kind of know the story, but you know, there's no phones here and these guys, which, which means that you completely lack of any believability that you're in modern times. You're not. And with the clothes that they were wearing, I mean, Tobias's body just sort of changed uh, his face changed his, everything changed once he came to set. I mean, it was incredible. So same thing with Hamish. I've never worked with an actor that I literally didn't recognize at dinner that night um, that was Lincoln earlier in the day. Like you could not pick him out of a lineup and say which person inhabited Lincoln today. Um, and Lily Taylor too was just amazing as uh, Mrs. Lincoln. She wore that black dress um, and, you know, at the, when she was holding court for her, um, after he died. And uh, she was just incredible. That dress was incredible too. Whatever that morning dress, I don't know what you call it, but I'll never forget that. And she was she was great to work with, Lily. And they were all wonderful to work with. Amazing characters. All of the actors were tremendously generous and kind in understanding what we needed them to wear in order to get the silhouette, specifically the women. We didn't ever really see anybody all the way down to corsets. But if you don't do that base layer, then the shapes that you put on top aren't going to be correct so be willing to to trust me and my team and go the distance necessary with all of these clothes was was really wonderful you know there's another clothing detail from these episodes that i wanted to ask you about and that's specifically when the booth brothers they're in new york it's the night of the manhattan fires uh they're out on the street they've obviously come from the theater but you've chosen to put them in Roman tunics. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was the thought process around, you know, at that moment with that scene? The night of the Manhattan fire plot, the booths were doing a one night only performance of Julius Caesar. There is a very famous photo that I had to go off of um, looking at their togas 
to to recreate them. And so, yes, it was one of those things where I met, you know, Anthony and and got and I was actually one of the first things I designed for Anthony was the toga because we were going to be doing stills for a poster that you saw earlier. But, you know, just seeing both of these guys and I was like, and here are your togas and here are your sandals and getting to do that. And it was really fun because the level of theatricality in the trim, it's just it's it's a different muscle to flex about, you know, this is a costume for costume's sake. This isn't supposed to be a real outfit. And so that was a lot of fun to do with both of them. I also think they appreciated that they were cotton and they were standing <laughs> next to the flame bars. And so they were not, you know, burning up in wool. They were getting to, you know, actually not be as hot as they typically were in their clothes when we were shooting. Other specific scenes or or experiences from this show that uh, you guys want to highlight? One for me was to realize that uh, even though the war was over, there was a lot of um, rebels out there, Southern rebels that were still trying to almost, for lack of a better word, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, guerrilla warfare. We did a scene on that street uh, where they set the Ford Theater on fire and, I mean, and uh, blew up uh, a hotel that night. And it's just, you know, five or six guys with Molotov cocktails. That was pretty intense because they knew that there were other Americans in that hotel. And there they were throwing um, firebombs into highly populated areas to continue the war. And that was while intense to shoot with uh, fire and bombs and extras. I was just like, you know, again, brought you back to the reality of the scenario down there that people uh, didn't want that war to be over. In some ways that's still trickling on today. I loved the whole section about George Sanders, who also tied into the Manhattan bomb plot and was another fun character to outfit. I mean, he made his money in fabrics and in the clothing trade. So he got to be a real peacock and Anthony Marble, who was just phenomenal, you know, wore them all beautifully. But the whole thing about smallpox and about diseases that were they were trying to infect shipments of uniforms and things that just again to Gary's point guerrilla tactics that I did not know about and then going on and seeing you know what was the hazmat clothing of the time and the answer is none there are no gloves. There are no masks. And, you know, we were shooting this in 2022. The crew was still entirely masked inside and outside. And so it was something that was really interesting and just bringing into juxtaposition, you know, how far we've come in, in that aspect. Well, the challenge of taking all of this historical detail, filling in what we don't know, and then delivering this period piece and, and what's really an engaging story. I, huge challenge. I, honestly, I keep talking about this all day. I, I have to say, and Katie would say too, that this uh, the material is based on the novel by James Swanson that is amazing, called Manhunt. And what Monica Blitzky was able to do with that is uh, incredible as well. It's really worth watching and get out there and check it out on Apple TV. Well, it's a great story. We've gone deep on a couple of episodes specifically, some general themes. If you're all interested in that, find Katie. She's got a lot of stuff out there on all the work that went into the wardrobe. Uh, a lot of amazing work that's coming together, guys. On that note, we're going to call it a wrap. Really great having you both here. Thank you so much, Skid. Thank you, Skid. See you soon, Katie. Hope See you're ya. well. Listeners, I always appreciate your feedback. You'll find my contact info at our website, below the line, one word, dot biz. that's B-I-Z. You'll also find past episodes and links to all of our social media, so check it out. Katie, where next are we going to see your work? That is yet to be determined. All right. Well, we're on big things, big things. <laughs> uh, get out get out on that Twitter, Katie. See what networking you can do. Gary, how about you? What have you been working on? I'm currently in South Carolina working on uh, Outer Banks for Netflix, and then um, hopefully some more good things to come. 
get everyone out there working again. It's uh, pretty slow out there for those that aren't working and uh, our hearts and souls go out to those guys that, and crew members that need to get out working. And uh, every day that the crew that I'm working with, uh, we all feel grateful that we are working and very cognizant that the studios need to pick it up and get these people working again. Hope for the same thing. As for me, you'll catch me on another episode of the podcast. Closing credits, thanks to Curtis Five for our music, John Juan for our logo, and to all our listeners, I appreciate you. The Below the Line logo is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. Please rate us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends. Thanks again from Below the Line.